Welcome to part two of the discussion of Matthew Peugeot's book, The Language of Creation, Cosmic Symbolism in Genesis, a Commentary. In the last video, we covered the background of the author and the structure of the book. If you haven't seen the first part, I encourage you to pause this video and click the link in the banner above or in the description below and watch part one. Now, if you're like, nah, I've already watched it, just get straight to the good stuff. Then buckle up and keep watching because we are getting into the content and the meta-symbolism of Matthew Peugeot and his book, The Language of Creation. Now to begin, we're going to start with the cover. When I go through a book like this and prepare a review, I like to start out with the title. Because if it's done correctly, the title can reveal exactly what the author needs to be going through. And it's setting the pace and the tone and really the parameters of what the author is going to accomplish. It also sets him up to have to prove everything that he says in the title. So what we have is The Language of Creation, Cosmic Symbolism in Genesis, a commentary. So let us begin with the. <laughs> Just kidding. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be starting off with cosmos or cosmic, cosmology. That's the first one that he addresses. Notice that he uses cosmic not universe. And because when I say universe, what do you think? You think stars and planets and the void of space and maybe the earth with the green and the blue and the clouds over it. But really, according to dictionary.com, cosmos is described as the world or universe regarded as an orderly, harmonious system. And cosmology as the branch of philosophy dealing with the origin and general structure of the universe. So I think correctly, he chooses cosmic or cosmos, cosmology, because it gives a cohesive whole of how the, the world comes together in harmony. It's how all of the parts work in unison. And then also notice that word, the origin. So we know that it's getting into, of course, what is the origin of the Christian story, Genesis. Okay, so fortunate for us readers, he gets right to it in chapter five. With the modern scientific universe, we often think of as composed of matter and energy, like in the field of physics. However, he lays out that in, in this ancient cosmology, it's really comprised of meaning and matter, or the terms heaven and earth. He gets right to saying, when considered from an ancient human perspective, the words heaven and earth refer to the two halves of the cosmos. This polarity completely encompasses reality. And we read on page 18 through 19 that spiritual reality, or heaven, informs corporal reality, or earth, with meaning and purpose. On the other hand, matter, or earth, expresses spirit, read heaven, by making it visible and tangible in the universe. So really... Heaven would be the, the intangible attributes, the meaning and the purpose, the theories that needs to be hosted by the, the tangible or the corporal or the earthly. So that's when we get heaven and earth. Really, we see that these are the two foremost extremes of the cosmos. So instead of asking something like a modern person like myself, we'd even ask when we're confronted with something, we would say, what is it made of? Well, the difference is that an ancient worldview would ask, what does it mean? What is its purpose? Okay, so that's the first part, heaven and earth. The second part of this cosmology is time and space. He talks about time as three things. The first one being the cause of change. The second one as cyclical transformation. And the third one, quite simply, is the opposite of space. Now, space, he describes as the stabilizing power against the transformative forces of time. Okay, important to note, again, this tug-of-war with language, he even brackets off time and space or heaven and earth, all of the words that are distinct to this ancient way of thinking, but we use them in modern terms, comp often completely the opposite of what they're intended to or originally were in this ancient cosmology. Space and time, they are, these are not 
in the modern usage of the terms. I just have to give you fair warning for those that haven't read the book yet. So these, this can take some time, <laughs> uh, if you will, because it takes a little bit to get used to. So maybe settle in, don't, don't get frustrated right away, uh, because he's really trying to lay out an entirely uh, different vocabulary, but he's compelled to use these same words that unfortunately mean very different things in the modern usage. So the examples that he gives for this cosmology is day and night. So if you look to Genesis in the first verses, it says that the sun rises in the morning and it arches over. If you look at it phenomenologically, it arches over the dome and sets in the evening. Okay, and while the sun is doing that, while time is looping, we work and there's dry land being formed and things are being built, we get things done. But then it, the work continues and con continues and continues until it is stopped by the cycle of time. And then, of course, what happens? Evening becomes morning, becomes the first day. And we see this loop. It's a good way to look at time according to this ancient cosmology. Another good example that he uses is the flooded land versus the dry land. Flooded land would be like the world is covered with water, like the flood with Noah. I mean, just functionally, what do you think of? Things are kind of floating around, they're bobbing around, they're not really being productive, things aren't getting done. There's a whole lot of random parts that aren't sinking up, like we would see in dry land in a city, for example. Kind of like Waterworld, for those that have seen that 90s classic. Another good example would be like that of an overgrown forest. So you think of a forest building out in space or multiplying the patterns of its seed, right? So it makes a tree, say pine cones or firs, and then it just makes more fir trees, more fir trees, more fir trees, and pretty soon the whole forest is just expanded in this, this space of multiplication. But then what happens? Then the transformative element comes in, like I'm from Northern California. In this area, we had the Valley Fire among many in recent years, and the fire just wipes it out. And it's, it's to the proportion of a cosmic fire. And what happens? Then the forest begins multiplying and building out space once again. Okay, a final example for this cosmology is a foreigner. Because a foreigner can come in and bring in, say, like new ideas or new ways of looking at things. And that can be a transformative element to a culture or a way of thinking. And so look at the status quo of maybe uh, the element of space, where we're producing these ideas and we're acting according to these philosophies and we're building our society upon them. And all of a sudden this outsider comes in and it's a thing of the second definition for time. It's a transformative element. And what that does is it can wash away some or maybe a lot or all of the ways of thinking and we are refreshed and then we start building upon something else and we start all over again. So this first part, as we walk through the, the title, he does a, a really great job of getting right to covering cosmic or cosmology defining it, laying a foundation, and is quite thorough in his explanation throughout. So let's go to the next section, language of creation. I decided to address these together because they seem so intertwined. And where we were just talking about chapter 5, the very next chapter in 6 on page 21, he gets into language of creation. So picking up on page 21, there's a quote that says, from the spiritual perspective, Creation is viewed as the manifestation of divine language. Okay, so really in this cosmology, there's a foundation on meaning and language, not, as he says, mindless mechanical causality. All right, so he's not holding the punches here. If we look at language, we have, especially the written language, what we have are these physical marks, right? And these random assortments of marks become alphabet because they are informed by abstract meaning or say like heaven comes down to earth which is just an assortment of random dashes and marks 
And then because of that information, it further clarifies or consolidates all of these random data points into language or into alphabet. And then from alphabet, more refined, it becomes into a grammar or vocabulary or even to its finer refinement, it would be a sentence. So on page 22, he quotes, thus a real but invisible connection is established between those physical marks and a universe that reaches far beyond the limits of this page. I, I just really, really enjoyed this passage. I, I had to reread it many, many times and it gets me excited because so you start thinking in maybe some limited fashion, but then a sentence like this just opens it up and you're like, oh my gosh, like, yes, words have huge meaning. We just don't even know the depths of meaning that, that we can be informed by or that heaven can inform us and we can see it coming together tangibly uh, in the earth. So just as humans speak and write and read English and Chinese, the universe has a cosmic language or expression or a way of taking, you know, just loose markings and raw material and through the information of heaven coming to this point where there's meaning. We understand what we're talking about. So just as humans communicate with language, the cosmos communicates through language as well. Okay. Writer needed to make an adjustment, the sun setting. Okay, so the third part is symbolism. Picks this up in the very next chapter, in chapter seven. And he calls symbols cosmic words and defines symbols as facts that embody higher truth. Symbol is a fact that embodies higher truth. And so he gives a helpful image and no, to my chagrin, this is not a Pokemon ball. Sorry, guys. But what he's describing is that similar to the letters in his description there, that really a symbol is where heaven and earth come together. And in this ancient worldview, these things are looked at as inseparable. Okay, so very important. He, he makes this rather strong claim. He says that everything and all events are factual and meaningful. There's the concrete reality and the spiritual significance. Okay, second big claim in this section is that these concepts are not metaphors. Rather, these are symbols at a micro scale, let's say. So the next important component to understand while reading this book is, and symbolism and understanding symbolism in general, is that there's a scalable nature to symbolism. What I mean by that is you can have a microcosm, you can have a macrocosm, and it stretches all the way across. Like you make marks on a rubber band, you can stretch it. Doesn't matter how big or small it gets, it's still repeating the same pattern. Okay, so for example, what we look at inside of the human being, right, with uh, uh, having heaven and earthly components or having time and space, we start seeing that also in the ecosystem or in a community or at the national level or at the cosmological level, right? They're still repeating the same patterns. Let's move on to the next point in the title, Genesis. It's the central text of the book, sort of because he includes a lot of other material, primarily in the Old Testament, or perhaps exclusively, I could be wrong, but I only noticed that he drew upon the elements of communion or the Eucharist, the bread and the wine. And outside of that, I'm pretty sure he just he stuck with the Old Testament writings. But he does veer pretty quickly from Genesis and starts hopping around to the Psalms and the wisdom literature to the prophetic literature and Daniel and, and et cetera. And really it's like we talked about in the previous view, the video, it, this is not a, a thorough, exhaustive line by line, verse by verse walkthrough, it's definitely more topical. So perhaps a, a better way of saying this would be the, the Genesis stories uh, would give a 
clearer picture about what's what's being used here or how he goes about tackling the, the Genesis material. Could be wrong. It's just a, a small detail that I would uh, suggest. You know, or perhaps leave Genesis out of the title. I don't know, but okay, so a personal attraction to this book was that I was reading through the book of Genesis last year when this book was introduced to me and I got really, really excited because it seemed like it was just what I was looking for. It's like, how do we dig into the deeper connections of what's happening and the symbolism? And so when I saw Genesis, that was one of the attractors for me. So who knows, I could be wrong on that. Again, it's kind of a minor point. And the last part is the, the subtitle of the subtitle, sub subtitle, a commentary. Again, like we covered in last video, this is not really a traditional commentary. It could be misleading, perhaps even clickbait, where it's, this text is really more so an argument for a worldview than it is a traditional, let's just take this one word at a time and figure out what it means. And then add in cross references from all of these other voices in the text or from other opinions. Definitely more an argument for a worldview. I think you could leave out the sub subtext of commentary. And this content is really a code for interpreting the Bible and recognizing the patterns from which it expresses its story. In chapter 8, in the footnote, he even says that language of creation can be used as a key to help decipher the Bible and other texts. So it's kind of like in a template form. And this can have its pluses and minuses. I know that Alistair Roberts addressed this in his wonderful overview and review of this book. He said that compared to authors like James Jordan, who really gets into the details and the particularities of each story, this one really lays out an argument for a worldview and then brings in the text as a way of proving that argument or a way of showing you how it works in the text. Okay, so in the title, we've gone through the language of creation, cosmic symbolism, and Genesis, a commentary. Yep, good so far. Are there any missing words that I think should have been in the title? Well, perhaps science. I know that this, this topic that he brings up in the beginning and primarily in the end and a bit throughout the body of, of the work is this contrast between the scientific and the ancient worldview or the modern and the symbolic. Um, so it, it would have been nice to have something like that as a, a guide or a hint towards, I mean, really one of the main points in the book. Uh, or perhaps he could show how science works within this ancient cosmology. Uh, I really like the point of reconciliation or transcendence between the worldviews. Uh, it would have been nice to have a hint or, uh, during the title or being able to, to see that reflected in the title. That's such a great point in the text. All right, so the next part of the cover is the... The logo, or the, the, the central map, if you will, or symbol. And what we have here is a, a symbol that shows that this is dentrocentric worldview, or a tree-centric cosmology, uh, encircled by time, or the Ouroboros. And the cosmic tree, of course, represents heaven above, where the, the heights of the tree reach towards the heavens and they draw in light and energy, and that informs the center of the tree. But then also the, the roots draw up the raw material, the minerals, into the, the heart of the tree. And so in that sense, heaven and earth meet. But it also is a good image for space as he lays it out, because space takes the, the seed, right, and multiplies it, kind of like in a fractal-like pattern. So the way that the the trunk and the branches grow, you also have that same pattern in the finer branches and the finer branches, and it continues this pattern. And then that is encircled by the loop of time. So 
So I'd like to offer a revision to the comments that I made regarding the logo in the previous video on structure, or maybe just push it a little bit further. It's really using this logo or this central symbol to describe the entirety of his work. So where we have the, the sun rising, right? It starts that arc of time, and he starts that with the symbolic and scientific worldview discussion. And then as the sun is rising and creating that arc, we get to work. And Pajot builds his argument and grows that tree and develops space. But then what happens is the sun sets and he ends with the place that he began with the talk on symbolic and, and scientific worldviews. What we have here is evening and morning one day. Let's get into the meta symbolism that's happening here with Matthew Peugeot and this book, as, as well as his brother. So to, if you would, just take a step back and zoom out from what we've covered so far. If we look at the cover, <laughs> if you look at what we've covered so far, <laughs> if you will, in the cover, uh, we see that there's a, a literary seed that he has developed here that grows into the fruit of the book. So he stays consistent to this pattern that's identified in the title and in this logo and just the cover as a whole. Now to the author, this cover is the language of creation, of Genesis, the, the origin of his story. That makes sense. So this cover is, is really the seed that is replicated and becomes the language of his creation or the language of his book that is expressed. Now, if we were to look at this meta symbolism of what's happening with the author, Matthew Peugeot seems to be assuming a symbolic role here, and that is of the foreigner. Like I briefly mentioned in the previous video, seems to assume this role of the foreigner that's kind of like the characters of Melchizedek or the visiting angels to Abraham or desert prophets like Elijah or John the Baptizers. And his book is something like his prophetic declaration. It's like one coming from the wilderness or from a foreign land to deliver a provoking message for people to heed the, the wisdom and, and the word of old. He's, he's, he's assuming this transformative agent. And he's coming to our city and saying, I want you to look at it this way. And if you really open up, this will become a flood that will wash away part or a whole lot of what you knew. And then through that, you will rebuild anew and hopefully stronger and better. Okay, are you with me? So let's take even one more step back and look at the Brothers Pajot, again, drawing from Dostoevsky. What is Jonathan's role in all of this? For, for those that are familiar with Jonathan's work, he's somewhat of a, a familiar figure. He's a public speaker. He's active on social media, be it YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or on his website, symbolicworld.com. He's a teacher. He's serving as somewhat of a priest, really. Uh, and priest being, you know, a familiar figure we know we can go to. Priest lives in this location, in the city, we can go to, to learn and for help. Okay, so if we were to look at Jonathan's role and compare it to that of his brothers, Matthew, Matthew. So Jonathan plays that of the familiar role, while Matthew plays that of the foreign. Okay, Jonathan is in the public sphere and operates there pretty often. Matthew, in that of the private, he's, he's somewhat of a recluse. In fact, most recently, Jonathan mentioned that, that Matthew doesn't even have a cell phone anymore. He's like off the grid, disconnected. He uses other people's phone to call and check in with his brother now and again. He's kind of like this in the wind floating figure that touches down and changes our world. It's like, whoa, where did he come from? Okay, you following me? So where Jonathan is the priest, 
that you is the prophet. Now, why? Why, why is this important? I, I, I think because we, we give our attention in different ways to familiar and foreign figures. So for example, a familiar person says, clean your room. Say your mom and dad or your uncle or your, your, your mentor. And you just, what do you do? You brush them off, of course. You're like, yeah, 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 I know, I'll get to it. I've, and you, it's just something that you've heard a hundred thousand times and it just seems to kind of settle into your subconscious and that's that. But then with a foreign figure, let's say, I don't know, a psychologist, says the same thing, clean your room, and all of a sudden you wake up and you transform your entire life, <laughs> you know, and your room spick and span. Okay, so this, this same thing happens to teachers and to pastors, you know. You, you, you say the same thing over and over again, you know. The power of life and death is in the tongue. Okay, and what are you thinking when you hear the pastor say that? You're like, yeah, 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 okay, Whew, man, I just can't wait. We got this game on TV, you're, okay. Or, oh man, I just cannot wait until I take a nap. Hey, I've been there. But when it's said by someone with the element of the foreign, it seems to capture our attention in a whole new way. It's kind of like the good cop, bad cop routine, something like that. The big question is, is this intentional? Now, is this the, the work of two mastermind brothers laying out a plan all along, kind of like in The Prestige? Or does symbolism happen? Thanks for watching, guys. Uh, if you like this content and you want to stick around and be notified of future videos, click the subscribe button as well as that little notification. Uh, if you liked it, click the like button. Uh, there's other ways to support, and the link's in the description below. I so appreciated covering this book. I will be coming out with at least one more video, so stay tuned for part three. And perhaps I'll zoom way in and get really topical and just uh, dissect one thing at a time in future videos too. Thanks for watching. I've really enjoyed all of the conversation and the comments and the questions in the previous video. A big thank you to Jonathan Peugeot for sharing the part one video with his brother and as well as on his Facebook page and his YouTube channel. Uh, it's just been wonderful to have so many other people join in and, and add to the conversation. I know it, for those that could tell right away, I, I drew upon the comments to help inform and make an even better video this case around. So let's do it again and hopefully part three will be an even better video in the days to come.